Hello, a very warm welcome to the program. My name is Felicity Ezewike. Now, everyone needs a place to call home. Housing is without question one of the central pillars of human security and well-being. It is for this reason that Sustainable Development Goal 11 aims for universal access to adequate, safe and affordable housing by 2030. That's less than eight years away. Is Africa on track? How accessible is affordable housing in sub-Saharan Africa? Statistics from the Center for Affordable Housing Finance Africa indicates that Nigeria has a housing shortage of more than 20 million units, with 700,000 units needed annually. The DRC housing backlog is estimated at almost 4 million units. South Africa has a housing shortage of approximately 3.7 million, which is estimated to be growing at 178,000 units annually. And of course, Uganda has a deficit of 2.4 million housing units, with 200,000 housing units needed annually. According to the World the African Development Bank, I beg your pardon, the recent estimated housing deficit of 50.5 million units in sub-Saharan Africa. The fact is, Africa is the fastest growing continent on the planet and demand for housing will increase exponentially during the next 30 years. Ensuring adequate access to quality housing is a challenge for many countries. How can Africa better unlock access to affordable housing? That's our focus today on One Slot. My guest is Nesta Mokojane, a lecturer at the Center for Built Environment, Central University of Technology, Free State Province, South Africa. Thank you very much for joining us on the program, Nesta. Um, evening, Felicity and your viewers. Let's start with, let's get to know what is built environment? What do you teach? No, the built environment is basically the management of um, our building infrastructure that would be anything, really, anything ranging from um, housing, as we've mentioned, um, uh, infrastructure such as your roads, your, your sewer, your water, electricity, anything that will make um, human beings to be um, in a better um, environment than we are now. Yeah, I mean, we need to establish that in the context of the conversation we're about to have. So um, what is the connection between quality housing, economic growth and social inclusion? Well, there's actually quite a big connection. Um, um, quality housing it depends. It's actually a question of perspective as to what we deem to be quality housing. But um, looking at most of this um, housing, um, um, the housing state in most African countries, specifically sub um, sub African um, countries, um, you will find that a lot of the people they are living in shanty towns, they are living in um, in what we call um, locations here in South Africa. Um, in other African countries, you'll find that um, it's it's a lot of um, population that's actually within your inner city. Um, but then when we speak of quality housing, that will obviously be um, a unit that will obviously allow people to, to live in a dignified manner that will be um, enough enough space um, where there's water, there's sanitation, um, there's, uh, there's a safe environment. It's basically a habitable space um, as per the United Nations has basically outlined as to what will um, um, constitute to be um, what we call now human settlements. From your expert viewpoint, how bad is Africa's housing deficit? It's, it's a serious challenge because we, we have to look at the population that we have in Africa. We, we have um, a fast growing population. We, we have a large majority of our current population, um, which is um, under the age of 40. So that's already um, telling us that going into the next um, 10, 20 years, um, as the population is getting older, there will be a need for more housing. Um, with obviously, people living longer and um, obviously notwithstanding the current challenge that we are having of um, the housing backlogs that most African countries are basically struggling with. Um, um, for instance, I would think uh, a case such as South Africa where we we having, I think as you mentioned in your statistics, I think around the 3.8 million um, housing backlog to, to resolve something like that. Um, I, I was listening to the figures that you gave of Nigeria as well, Uganda and the other sub-Saharan African states. 
um, to resolve those, those, those sort of challenges. Um, it will primarily just be centered on, on three areas. Um, one, it, it has to do, it's largely centered around government policy, um, where there has to be a change in how um, African governments are approaching the challenges of housing. And, and two is basically how how to how to how to basically package um, housing delivery and three we have to look at alternative technologies that can assist us to to better fast track and to better deliver housing um, for instance um, if if um, if Nigeria will need 700,000 units per year um, I think we, we then have to look at the construction um, technologies that are being used are they adequate um, if we were to to explore maybe alternative building technologies um, could we not maybe increase that number um, there are various studies that are being done around alternative building technologies being the key to to resolve the housing challenges but um, notwithstanding um, obviously there needs to be um, a political will from 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 government and that political will um, obviously um, has to um, to a large extent um, it has to now link into into the fiscus of 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 an individual state to say from the available fiscus um, how much is made available. We do understand that the, there are um, competing priorities within um, within a government sphere of, of, of operation. Uh, but to resolve housing, it's it's really a challenge, and um, it's not a challenge that I do not believe that it is not insurmountable. Um, it's it's something that can be done. Um, just focusing on those three things, which are basically just political will, um, policy restructuring, and um, the investigation of alternative building technologies. Thank you. Hey, you, you just mentioned uh, quite a number of um, um, solutions that can be explored to actually uh, make housing affordable to accessible uh, more appropriately as well. Uh, to people. But before we get to explore more of this solution, because we're going to try and take them one after the other, but before that, I want you to speak a little more on uh, the government part of it, the leadership part of it. Um, how aware are African leaders and how seriously are they taking um, the issue of housing in the continent? No, thank you for that. No, I think more can definitely be done. Um, I think of, um, when we talk about awareness, um, that um, it's basically housed within um, a ministry or a department of housing within an individual um, African state. Um, um, the United Nations being um, a key driver in ensuring that um, there is a serious um, drive towards um, resolving um, the housing backlog challenges. They are making available various grants. They made available, I believe it was, um, 2.7 billion US dollars um, to, to West Africa um, in the last financial year. Um, they are making more or less um, a similar contribution to, to African, to sub-Saharan states um, to, to assist them in resolving housing challenges. But then um, that money obviously does go to government, but then the challenge then becomes once it gets to government, um, how does government then spend the money? How does it filter down, you know, to ensure that um, the, the common man on the street actually benefits from those sort of grants. Um, there, there are various grants that are available, but then as well, um, the initiative has to be taken by a member state through their Department of Housing or Ministry of Housing to ensure that um, they are um, making use and they are having access to the United Nations grants and making those applications that can assist them. But without um, actually also looking at the grants, um, my view on that as well is uh, each each, each state, um, we can take South Africa, for instance, where a large part of their, their national budget, um, it goes to, to housing. Um, South Africa is only one of three countries that live in the world that are still providing um, free housing to, to its citizens. Um, obviously, that has its pros and cons, but that shows or it speaks rather to the commitment that, that a particular state has towards resolving the housing backlog. But every state will be different. It will have its own challenges. But um, once you've already derived a policy to say, no, look, um, we are going to, to be providing um, people with um, ways to, or rather with um, giving them access to, to quality housing, then you have to look at um, other factors as well. Um, you have to look at um, the income gaps that exist in society, then how do you bridge those income gaps? Yeah, yeah. Those... yeah you, you, let, me, let me interject quickly. I, I want to, so that I don't miss it. You talked about each... Um, state or government or country having unique challenges, right, sure. when it comes to housing. But are there common thread 
in these challenges that can be identified across board? If yes, what are they? Well, there, there will be a number of um, identical challenges that we see specifically across sub-Saharan Africa. Um, for instance, in the last 20 years, um, the issue of regional migration, um, um, people from the DRC, from other African states, such as New Zimbabwe, flooding into South Africa, um, obviously um, through political upheaval in their own countries. Um, obviously, when they do arrive in South Africa, they, the South African government has to provide um, housing to, to those particular people. Uh, but now we are seeing in recent, in recent years, the last five or six years, um, a migration towards East Africa, towards Rwanda, because of um, um, the increase in economic activity in Rwanda and um, and um, the prosperity of Rwanda as we've come to, to know it in the last uh, decade or so. Um, but the challenges as well, they, they relate more specifically to policy making, to say, um, what do you as a government, um, or rather, what, what do you as a government um, um, provide um, in terms of um, bridging, or rather providing a subsidy, if you can call it, it's actually a subsidy um, to say, no, look, the, the, the low income earning individuals, um, how can we meet them halfway to ensure that they are also getting access to, to finance for them to be able to, to own homes and, and those sort of things. So access to finance remains one of the, one of the biggest challenges as well uh, in African states. Yeah, um, a partnership is one of the, um ways being explored to improve housing across the continent and hopefully in the second part of this conversation we'll explore that further but i want to ask you about what we are doing currently it is projected that 1.2 billion urban dwellers that's what we'll have by 2050 and new residents are coming 4.2 uh, 4.5 i beg your pardon in informal settlements each year um we've talked about the challenges you've mentioned them but what have we been doing in the efforts to address the housing deficit across the board that you know that you can off the top of your head just um, highlight? I can I can actually think of two. Um, we've actually been doing the same thing but expecting a different result. That's why we're having the challenges that we're having now. Um, that's why I, I believe that um, as a way to actually prepare for what's coming in the future, because the stats are there, the projections are there as to what we, we, we are going to be experiencing in the next 20, 30 years, urban to regional, um, or rather um, rural to urban migration. Um, what other governments have really started doing is they've actually changed some items of policy. Um, in South Africa, for instance, we have what is called the, the RDP program. Government is basically moving away from that, where now they are providing what is called FLISP. Um, it's more um, um, a subsidy program, like I was talking about, where um, instead of government just providing free housing, um, which actually also has its own um, challenges down the line, where you basically just kick a can down the line, and then it becomes someone's problem. So um, that's one of the solutions that that's there. But then as well, it's actually approaching the whole um, issue of infrastructure differently. Um, we would also appreciate that uh, with growing population, there's also a serious lack of space. And by space, we mean that in our urban areas, um, there's actually very little space that's now becoming available. Uh, each country understands and appreciates that it will have its own different challenges around land ownership. But now what governments have started doing is they've started actually going the route of, of blocked units or what we call CREs, community residential units, which are more um, block of flats type of developments, which can actually um, accommodate a lot more people, but um, using or rather with a much smaller floor area, as we'll call it. That way we can actually resolve some of the issues around um, the increase of the um, um, the growing shanty towns that we see on the periphery of our cities. Thank you. Yeah, what, what would be like a, a model approach? Um, you said some of the things that's been done um, is part of the challenge. Um, what would be your suggestion of, a, of an approach that would actually work and could be copied uh, by other parts of the continent? All right, no, the approach will basically be centered on, on, on three key, key areas. One is political, um, it, the first one will be political willingness um, from each individual government, where each government needs to um, appreciate the challenges that are currently there. Um, and obviously understanding that housing um, is enshrined as, as part of human rights uh, together with water and sanitation. So the first has to be that appreciation. And then, and then secondly, it will, it will have to be now an issue of policy refinement to say, yes, 
as a government, we, we agree that um, we do have other competing challenges. There's healthcare, um, there's transport, there's energy and whatnot. But um, for us to, to actually deal with all the other issues, we need to ensure that um, we are dealing with a fundamental societal issue, which is housing. If we resolve the housing issue correctly, then um, we can actually deal with all the other issues. Then the third point will be then, um, it's a question now that speaks more to, to, to finance, which is um, how are we actually going about the construction of, of housing and um, are the methods that we are using correct? Um, how can we explore other methods? Um, there, there are alternatives building technologies that, that are out there that can be um, considered. Um, obviously, when we look at a cost, for instance, for 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 a small house, um, which is around 90 square meters, we, we're looking at, at anything between between um, you know 6,000 US dollars to, to 12,000 US dollars. Um, but if we are to be using alternative building technologies, um, we can actually drop the cost of that house to anything between 3.5 to 5,000. So it means within, with whichever available budget, we can actually produce more units and we can um, obviously um, house more people in, in quality affordable homes um, and give them a sense of dignity and belonging as well as, as citizens of the world. All right, Nesta, let's, let's take a short break now. Uh, when we come back, we will uh, talk a bit more of the solutions that you've um, suggested. We'll try to expand it and see how it can actually be um, app appreciated across board after this break. Stay with us. Good to know you're still with us. I still have ne Nesta Mokajane, Mokajane, I beg your pardon, uh, with us. Thank you very much again for giving us your time. Uh, someone in your field quite agrees with you. I'm talking about the head of communications at um, Shelter Afrique, Babatunde Oyateru. He suggests in a publication that to solve Africa's housing deficit, we must focus on the policy environment. And the best way he thinks for us to do that is through multilateral action. You also talked about it, a government policy as one of the solutions. So I want us to begin first off with what does he really mean when he talks about multilateral action? Um, and second, do you concur? If yes, what specific policies is being referenced? No, thank you. Um, I believe he's spot on. Um, I think primarily when we're speaking of policy, um, we also can't divorce the policy from challenges that are facing our governments. Um, uh, I think when we, we look at policy, you know, um, we have to first understand um, what mechanisms are there um, from government to actually show their political uh, willingness to actually resolve the housing challenge. But um, one that actually comes to mind is, is called um, Triple P, which is a public-private partnership um, where, where a state will, will partner up with, with a private entity um, towards a specific goal. And that specific goal, um, as we, we are coming more accustomed to in South Africa, especially within the build environment field, is where um, um, our uh, National Department of Human Settlements or Ministry of Housing will partner up with, with specific um, international funders um, towards a specific development of a particular piece of, of land or in an area. That way, government is actually only just spending a fraction of the money that um, they will normally spend if they were to take the project on all by themselves. But now that's also tied to, 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 to private business, where if there's actually a private partner, there has to be some sort of a business model that exists where that property will be able to, to be self-maintaining and it will be a self-reliant property through through profit generation and, re and revenue generation so that maintenance can be done on such properties. Whereas before, um, government's policy would have just been we are government, we will be um, you know, taking the burden or the brunt of the, of the expenditure that's required. We provide housing, then we walk away. Then what we'll see is within a very short period of time, um, we'll see that a lot of those structures to surely contract workmanship um, will just start deteriorating. And we, before you know it, it becomes more like another shanty town. So um, it's actually, um, you know, uh, 
just going around as if you you basically chasing your own tail. That's why to, to resolve the housing challenge, we um, government specifically they will, they will need uh, private partners to come on board so that um, whatever is being done um, is actually is actually sustainable in terms of um, maintaining itself and ensuring that government can actually use that money to to actually unlock um, the other challenges or backlogs around housing that are there. Thank you. Uh, the, the, when, when people talk about uh, PPP, there is this concern from the ordinary people. The idea is to make housing not only accessible but affordable. So where does those low-income earners, those artisans who might not have steady income, how do they come into? Because sometimes they say when you talk public-private partnerships, um, the partners are there to make um, gains for themselves. So this, uh, people argue, tend to increase the cost for those and make it not accessible, really. What, what's your take here? Um, my take is, look, I'll take South Africa as a case study with that particular one, where um, what's actually coming to my mind is you, you create chaos to benefit from that chaos. So um, South Africa has been a particular interesting case study. They, they would um, provide free housing, as we know it, but free housing has its own challenges. But then as well, it serves certain political agendas where the majority of the population will keep electing you and keeping you in power because they know that if we elect a certain minister, so we are going to be getting free housing. But then we have to look at the statistics around delivery. Are they delivering? I think they're just doing enough so that they can um, remain in power. But um, when you compare um, you know, um, the stats from one country to another, you will see that there's a very poor rate of housing delivery. Um, so when we talk about the low income earners, um, the ones who really the will struggle to to get access to 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 any funding, you know, to to be in what we can term um, a quality house. Um, there are various grants that are available. There's there's a FLISP program that that normally exists, which is a financially linked individual subsidy program, which actually is is focused or aimed um, at low income earners. You know, um, people who are earning um, almost just below the um, the breadline, um, where government is basically now subsidizing um, a portion of, of their houses or their homes so that they can as well get access to, to quality housing. Thank you. So, and it's working. Is it working? Well, I would say it could, it could work better if, if, for instance, in South Africa, if there was no um, notion of free housing because the free housing policy is still there. So people who would normally be in a position to to be able to afford um, houses like that through government um, funding or government grants, they do not want to go that route. They rather be in the queue to receive free housing from government. So, if if it is if it is adjusted in a way, it it might not work. It, it could work not just for South Africa but for other African countries. Do you think? Indeed. No, absolutely, absolutely. I think that there's actually a big potential in the other African states. We've seen it work tremendously well in East Africa, particularly in Rwanda, um, where with their yeah, community residential units, um, it's, it, it's, it's also a type of, um, of, of grant ownership where government will subsidize a particular portion of, of the property. It happened quite well in Libya as well. Um, so no, it's, the, the case studies are there, that it's actually quite a sustainable and effective model. Okay, I, I would have loved to explore where the African continental free trade area connects with your uh, concern over regional migration and how it connects to housing. But in the interest of time, I'd like you to speak a little on the suggestion that Africa, you, you talked about the South African model, but their suggestion that we should look at the Singaporean uh, model. What, what do you know about that? What can you tell us about that? And is it something Africa should look at? Um, yes, no, they can. Um, the one thing that we need to give kudos to to Singapore is that there was, firstly and foremost, there was political willingness from the leadership of the country to look at the problem, to identify and to um, acknowledge the problem and how to best go about it. Um, I think we can borrow a lot from the Singaporean model, but it, it first has to start with um, with political will and. Um, I'm sorry to interject, Nesta. For those that are just that don't know a lot about the Singaporean model, could you just tell us um, what it looks like and maybe the areas that we can take? So, um, the Singaporean model is um, basically more like what South Africa is doing now, which are the CRU um, community residential units, where um, for for your instance, for your low income earners, 
government would actually subsidize them or put them into what we call apartments, um, but um, it's basically quite um, good, good housing, um, which has actually done tremendously well in reducing the number of shanty towns um, and, and basically reduce um, the large quantities that you normally find around our cities of, um, of um, you know, uh, uh, poor housing standards. Okay, so how would we, this work for us? Is it something that, you know, we can replicate across board? You keep talking about the political will. Do you see mm -hmm. our leaders being motivated um, by the work that's being done in Singapore to effectively, beyond the rhetoric, do something tangible to replicate yeah, it? The single, yeah, thank you. No, the Singaporean model has been there for a while. I think we've had ample time and opportunity for us to, to have replicated from it. Um, that's why sometimes I'm of the view that um, sometimes political leadership, they, they create chaos to just benefit from that chaos. Um, they keep the problem there long enough because, um, you know, the problem being there actually helps them get reelected into power. But, but I think just away from the politics now to, to actually address the housing issues. Um, we can borrow a lot from the Singaporean model. Um, specifically, I believe, um, given that um, economic climates or economic times are now very different from what they were two, three decades ago, which I believe we missed a golden opportunity where our economies were just in the right state for us to have actually dealt with the housing crisis a lot better. Um, but I think now for us to actually replicate that, the Singaporean model, it will take a lot of um, private public partnerships for us to be able to do it successfully. I still want to go back to those low income earners. I don't know if I missed what you said about them because, the, again, the idea is not just to make it accessible but to make it affordable. These partnerships you, you keep talking about, um, can you give us like a base example of a workable plan that somebody who, for instance, makes a, a daily income of less than say, $10, I don't know how that works, uh, can be able to save up enough to, say, I own, if not a, a house, but at least an apartment. Sure, sure. Um, normally, how that works will be different from how um, um, the, the private sector will work, in the sense that if, if you or I, if we want to buy a home, then you should have a certain amount of money saved, which um, would either give the bank as a deposit for them to, to be able to finance your 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 bond or your home your home loan as we call it, um, but these people will have to appreciate that they cannot even have any money left over for any savings. So what normally happens is um, um, you just need to, to be employed. You can be earning as as little as um, I'm going to say it in rents three thousand five hundred rents. That that's about um, two hundred and fifty US dollars a month. Um, you can be earning as low as that, and then um, you'll still be given access to housing. Because as long as you're working, government is saying, no, look, if, if the cost of a, of a house, um, it's around um, 150,000 rand, which when translated to, to US dollars, that will be around um, 10,000 US dollars. Um, we as government will be able to subsidize 80 percent of this house. The reason why we want you to be contributing even as little as $5 a month towards this house is because we want to instill a sense of ownership. Because there are other various challenges that have to do with housing where government is providing housing to, to people. As soon as you, you're given a house um, and you're selling the house, then you're going back into the waiting line. So those are some of the societal challenges that are also arising from, from trying to resolve the housing backlog. Okay, you, let's stay with the partnerships. I mean, most of the success we've recorded in Africa, I've said that before in the program, in the course of this program, is as a result of PPP. Um, what factors, is there a model of this, you, you, I think you've mentioned uh, quite a few, but just to highlight it, is there a particular model of this PPP that has worked? If yes, what are the factors that contributed to the success of the partnership and how can other African uh, countries leverage off that to d build their own models at home? Thank you, thank you. Um, when we speak of, of housing, um, I think it goes back to the discussion we were having earlier to say um, there are other things that need to be put in the ground before we can actually start building the units. We, we will need um, reliable bulk water, reliable bulk sewer, reliable electricity supply, and those things can, can primarily just be done by government. If, if a private developer 
were to get those um, from his own pocket, that will make the, the entire housing development financially unviable. So government's contribution normally is to bring the bulk services into an area, thereby dropping the cost of development if you're going to be dividing that cost of development per unit. Um, so when government has already done that, what we what we will term a bulk contribution on the project, and then also coming and um, um, providing a certain contribution towards the actual building or construction of the actual structures, um, you'll see that the cost per structure actually becomes a bit more affordable. So the private entity will normally just come in through um, their own professional team of consultants, architects, quantity surveyors, civil engineers, and so forth. And they will basically now be playing more um, a tenant and leasing management role, where they will be in charge of, look, um, if we are done with the construction, our role now is to ensure that whoever we are putting into these units, um, they are um, primarily, they, they, they will prioritize families, uh, and not single unmarried people. So we'll put in families and obviously we'll be collecting um, a certain amount of rent and also a portion of that rent is going to be funded or subsidized by government. So by, by so doing, you're creating a model way that particular development is self-sustaining because um, we are actually just avoiding an issue where um, the development has been put down, um, government hands it over to the community, government walks away, you come back in three years and the whole place is dilapidated because there's no maintenance, there's no one who's caring for it, there's crime in the area and all sorts of things that happen around um, our shanty towns. So that's a model that, that I believe works. And by so doing, when you have um, a private um, entity or, or a tenant and leasing manager managing that property, you're creating a space where um, as much as it's a block of flats, if we can call it that, but it's a safe space where kids can actually be outside because there will be shared communal parks, shared communal football fields and the like, where it, it actually feels like it's, it's a home environment and not more like um, your normal block of flats in, in the center of a city. Thank you. I, I need you to validate this figure because when I saw it, I was a bit, uh, uh, I, I was taken aback. It says 97 to 99 percent of people in sub-Saharan Africa uh, do not have access to formal financing that will help them start, you know, either building or assessing uh, homes. Is this, is this a true figure? No, indeed, indeed. Um, because when you look at the, the gaps between um, the, um, the high and low income earners, it's, it's quite massive, especially in, in, in countries such as your, your Angola, Rwanda, uh, Namibia, South Africa, Zimbabwe as well. Um, so in, in resolving a challenge like that, this is where um, those ones that, um, you know, that 97% that you're referring to that really cannot even afford to put away uh, barely $10 in savings a month. This is when our government um, has to come up with a plan to say, um, to, to just give housing and uh, not instill a sense of ownership. It's creating other challenges we can, which we can basically see from other case studies such as um, South Africa. So in so doing, we, we need to instill a model where we as government, we are subsidizing for your individual homes, but then you remain accountable to maybe 10% of the value of that home. Thereby, you just need to give us um, five US dollars a month or whatever. Mortgages are one of the fastest growing segment in African retail banking with an sure. estimated um, uh, growth, annual growth rate of 6% between 2017 and 2022, but many Africans do not qualify for mortgages or cannot afford interest rates that um, is applicable in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, I think that's about 14%. How, in, in your thinking, can we make housing credit more accessible, not just to those who are of average income, but even to low-income earners? Is that no, possible? Um, no, thank you. Um, I think we, the first problem that exists with that particular model is who's providing the, fi the, the funding or the financing. It's normally private business. And private business, they are, they are in it to make profit and to make a return. Um, so normally, they would require for certain income earners. And if the large majority of our population um, is obviously below what is required, this is where government has to play a more leading role. Um, through policy redirection and policy refinement to say, no, look, um, for the guys that do not or cannot afford um, to take out mortgage loans, this is how you guys can, can qualify for what we call gap financing or, um, or grants. Um, that's more like the, um, the flip model, the financially linked individual subsidy program for low income earners where 
um, government is basically providing that excess gap funding that is required for them to get access to quality houses. Now, you talked about innovation. There are some financial innovations as well. So, uh, there's the rent-to-own models, housing, microfinance, and, you know, mortgage-backed securities. Are these any good? And if yes, how can it be improved or to make it more accessible? I would say yes and no. Um, they are good if you can afford to, to do a rent-to-own, number one. Uh, number two, um, if you can afford to be part of um, um, the guys who are um, normally preferred to be part of microfinancing because um, yeah, there's no money risk analysis that is done to define. Sorry, let me let me before before you continue with the response, could you explain how that um, rent to own model works? Um, basically, you you would have identified a home, um, but now you do not have for say let's say the required deposit by by, by the bank or by the by the seller um, for that particular unit. Then you enter into into an agreement with either a bank or or through the seller directly. Where, where you you're basically paying um, a portion of of that property you can be paying it over to a bank as uh, it's not very much it's not very much different from a bank loan um, but you could be paying a portion um, of of um, of that property um, off in, on monthly installments more like a typical um, rent when you're just a tenant and you're renting a place but then the, the idea is um, the amounts that you're paying they're accumulating uh, more like as when you'll be paying off a particular property. So with, with that being said, after a particular period of time, um, as much as you do not have full ownership of that particular building, um, but over a period of time with you paying your rents and not defaulting, um, you would have actually paid enough. And there's actually other models as well of rent to own where now government can also provide um, can also provide a grant or they can also provide some gift, sort of gap funding to say, no, look, you can only um, rent this place for five years, then we are going to pay off the remaining 15 years. Then after on the sixth year, you're going to get um, ownership of the property. Okay, so go back to your, the response you gave about uh, yes and no, if these um, financial innovations on improving access to housing is um, any good and how we can make it more accessible. Yes, no, no, indeed. Um, it, it's, it basically speaks a lot in my understanding to, to gap finance and to say if we have a large portion of our population um, that cannot even access or have access to, to, to the required finance for them to be able to get into decent homes, then um, we, we are basically then stuck with um, um, going back to government again to say, no, look, we need you guys to come on board. Can you provide gap funding to assist those people that cannot get access to the required funding for them to, to be able to get proper homes? It's also um, a form of a model of, of this FLISP, which is a financially linked individual subsidy program where uh, people will be subsidized for them to, to be able to, to own homes. But that only happens over um, a medium to, to long term period. I think the required term is 15 to 20 years uh, before you actually own, own a home. Okay, um, you've talked about some innovations that we could uh, look at. Um, can you tell us about uh, some of them out of the box, radical ideas that is being implemented um, in the housing yes. sector? We have just about eight years to go to meet that uh, 2030 target. Are we ever going to get there? Sure, sure. Um, I think that actually speaks a lot to um, the construction sector actually just as well. Um, catching up with the other sectors such as manufacturing, where we are getting a lot of improvements and a lot of advancements in terms of innovation and technology in the manufacturing sector. Um, I would think um, the way in which we are constructing houses, the traditional method of construction, I think there's a lot wrong in how we are doing it. Um, the other sectors that move forward, the construction sector stay behind. That's why it's costing so much um, to, to just construct a single dwelling. Um, so if we could look at those things through um, alternative building technologies, I saw in one of the slides that you were showing there, where you, you, you had the, the Moladi um, construction system, where it's basically just formwork, where they go and they put up panels, and they put in mortar into the panels, and within two days you can actually have a full roofed, um, uh, completed structure. Um, so when you look at that, to say, no, look, if we, we can do a complete structure, within two days um, as compared to how long it will take us to, to build um, the same structure if we were to use traditional construction methods, which will roughly be anything between three to four weeks. And it means we can actually have a lot more houses on the ground and we can actually resolve the housing challenge a lot quicker because it's all about the numbers. 
um, the numbers are there in terms of the current delivery, um, you know, with, through the various different states, um, the current um, population growth projections as to where we'll be in the next 20, 30 years, and how um, um, our cities will look if we do not actually take urgent and and um, more strong-willed methods in resolving the housing challenge. Okay, I want to go back to something that I almost forgot to speak to you about, and that's the access to land conversation. Across Africa, a lot of persons, yeah, uh, the innovations about instead of buying a house, buy a flat, is still relatively foreign to some people. They wouldn't want to buy a flat. They would like to have land and build houses on it. Um, what would be your suggestion to the question of access to land? Is it, is it still as, um, is it something that should be given to the public-private uh, sector partnerships? Or should we continue with the model of, I want to buy a land, I want to build a house, uh, you know, that is mine, independent of anyone else? Yeah, no, it's actually a very hot topic, um, especially in South Africa. We, I think um, in the last 20 years, around the, uh, the 2000s, um, where there was what we term land grabs, um, because I think the challenges that were there um, in Zimbabwe are challenges that are actually present in most African countries where land ownership um, in some African states is primarily um, the state will own um, the large majority of the land and private business and private individuals will only own a small percentage. In other countries such as Africa, you'll find that um, around 85% of all the land is owned by uh, minority groups. Um, so that creates a huge challenge where you have now a government that is trying to to ensure that they are able to provide housing to people, but there is no land to do so. So this is where now um, you know it becomes very tricky because now for you to go and buy a piece of land, um, you know, if the, we have to use the principle of the willing um, willing seller, willing buyer. Um, so if if the owner of the land is is unwilling to sell the land, or rather they are selling it at an overinflated market price, is going to make the cost of the development. Um, financially unviable when we look at how much it will eventually cost to construct one one small unit. So um, land ownership is, is is a very important topic, um, um, but for for governments to resolve that, um, I believe um, I'm speaking from the cuff, but I believe all land well, should actually belong to the state. Uh, what, what, what would be you? You've been in this industry for quite a while, so you you have an idea what works and what. Um, Africa should be looking to model our future housing and um, um, projects uh, towards. So what would you suggest as a way to address this question of access to land? Because again, if you try to uh, connect it with migration, for instance, people that migrate from one place to the other, there is hesitancy to sell to sell land. You know, this is my bet right. I can't sell it. So how can we, uh, should we begin to address the question of access to land um, in a way that will benefit our efforts to increase access to affordable housing? Great. Um, there's actually a term that is used, um, which they call expropriation of land without compensation, which is um, a very um, scandalous term, especially in, in this part of the continent. But in, in addressing some of the challenges where we find that there's very restricted amounts of land available, if, um, if a particular piece of land is going to be serving the needs of the greater population, um, for instance, if a particular piece of land is going to be used by, by government, by the state, to provide housing for people, where um, government has tried by all means to get a necessary piece of land, which can be used to house people, if government cannot do so, then government, um, if the seller is obviously unwilling to part with the land at a reasonable market-related price, then there are those um, items that do 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 exist around its procreation of land um, without compensation. And then the compensation is obviously then resolved by, uh, by the cost through litigation. Let's go back again to political will. All of these ideas are great. Some of the suggestions are really good. You talked about how um, people kept, keep a situation going to benefit them politically. So. If, if you were to advise a government, for instance, as to uh, the right 
some of the policies that they should be working on that would cut across board. So if you, whether you're a migrant, whether you're a resident, however you are, you can have access to affordable housing. How would you even begin to tackle that? Um, I think, first of all, um, you know, the issue on migration is, is quite a sensitive topic as well. But I think um, we, we just have to um, appreciate and understand that, um, you know, the challenges that are available or the challenges that are, are there in Africa that we're currently dealing with, um, one has to um, take appreciation of the fact that um, um, we will have migrants, uh, people that move for various reasons, some for political asylum. And um, as much as um, it may be beneficial um, to a state if those people will contribute um, positively to an economy through through paying tax, because it's through tax paying that government will be able to raise the necessary funding required for them to go and implement some of these projects. Uh, but um, unfortunately, um, you may find that that's not always the case, but that as it, as it may be, um, you know, African states are not, are not um, an island all by themselves. They are part of the global community. They are part of the United Nations. And each country has a responsibility towards the other country to take in um, the citizens of another country if it's so required. So, so with, with that being said, my advice to government would be um, we, we would first have to, because I believe that in some instances there is political work. It's just an issue of the right approach in terms of um, um, also having an appreciation of the fact that there's only so much that is available. With the money that is available, how can we make that little that's available go a long way? Then this is where now we will have to look at various options that are available. Um, one of those being the triple P that we discussed extensively. But then as well, um, what other methods can we implement um, that can actually ensure that with the little that is available, we can get the maximum outcome in terms of um, the number of houses that we can put on the ground. So um, I think it will, it will have to link more to to the issue of policy and us refining policy again. Yeah, how, how, I, I need you to emphasize a bit more on this um, issue because in a country like Nigeria, for instance, we have um, real estate scams where this PPP arrangement sometimes innocent uh, people are exploited in their quest to get accommodation. So what element in the policy do you think um, we should also look at to improve upon. So we don't have situation where you have agreements that are supposed to benefit the people. But like you said, when one government goes away, the whole um, plan is in shambles. No, I think it's important to work through um, a national vision. Um, I think, uh, so for instance, in the, in the case of Nigeria, um, it may be beneficial if, um, despite... Um, all the political changes that are happening and that will happen um, is to work towards a vision for, if you say, a national development plan 2014, 2040. This is what we as Nigeria would have liked to achieve towards resolving a particular challenge. Not, I know that for, for, for a policy document like that to come into place, it normally has to be championed by a particular government, but it has to be adopted by the majority you know, across all the political lines, all the political divisions to say we as Nigeria irrespective of whichever government is in place. In 2040, we want to reduce the housing backlog in Lagos to a certain percentage. We want to reduce the housing backlog in Abuja to a certain percentage. All right, in, in 20 seconds, if you can, uh, do you think we will meet, that, are we on track, let me put it that way, to meet the SDG in 2030 when it comes to housing in Africa? Um, no, we are not. Um, the, the, the challenges are far too many. Um, there's very little time that is left. We have eight years left. Um, unless there is serious intervention required from from um, statesmen, from from government, um, and it's until it's all hands on deck, I think we'll we'll miss that that target by by a mile. Well, thank you very much, Nesta, for speaking with us on this very very uh, touchy issue. Thank you. In closing, I'll just say the construction of millions of affordable homes for the masses in Africa represents, like he has said, a major challenge. And getting to 2030 is not really on our radar. We might not admit it. But though it's a challenge, it's also an opportunity for sustainable development, for employment creation, and of course, poverty reduction. We can do it. I believe strongly that we can. Thank you very much for watching. I will see you next time. For now, it's bye-bye from me.